Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to this session. Um, a few of you I may have heard me, but the, our scanner isn't working. They're switching out the disk, so we'll get you scanned on the way out. We'll make sure you get credit for this class. Of course, this is the first one we're doing, and a little technical difficulties, but no problem, right? Uh, my name is Carol Pavanka. I'm the Director of Continuing Education for AISC. I want to welcome you to the NASCC. Um, just a great group, and I think we have a really terrific session for you today. Um, and I have the honor of introducing this session. Barry Arnold is from Utah, and I met him probably seven years ago. He got his BS degree in civil engineering from Utah State and his MS from um, same school emphasis in structural engineering. He's a co-owner of a firm in Salt Lake City, ARW Engineers, and is the president there. He serves, um, he has served as the SEAU president, and I actually am from Montana, and Barry was really instrumental in helping us get our SEA started up there. He's very, um, very giving to the industry. He is on our NASCC committee here um, at AISC, and he's a member of the NCSEA Structural Licensing Committee. He's been practicing for 18 years. So I just want to read a little blurb he wrote. Today, Barry asks a very important question. Have you got stiffness? A provocative and thought-provoking journey into the nuances and idiosyncrasies of the often ignored and sometimes disrespected and underappreciated world of base plate design for lateral force resisting systems. So with this, it's actually my honor and privilege to introduce Barry Arnold to you. I would ask, we're taping this, if you can hold your question till the end, Barry and I will remain after um, and answer any questions. Have you got stiffness? That's a good question. And one that's hard to answer because most of us don't know. Some of us are going to say, well, yeah, sure, I've got stiffness. I've got plenty of stiffness. At least I think I do. How do I know if I don't? Others are going to say, well, I don't know if my base plates are stiff enough, but does it really matter? Today we're going to answer both of those questions by engaging in an enjoyable analytical study of moment or lateral force resisting base plates. We're going to talk just a little bit, briefly, about some things you know. Then we're going to get into a bunch of things that you may not know. Things that you may not have considered when designing these critical elements. And then we're going to cap it all off by talking about the things you absolutely need to know in order to make sure that your base plates are performing in a reliable and predictable manner. Let's begin by talking about the things we know. AISC has told us that the base plate column connection is one of the most important elements in the steel structure. Now doesn't that just go without saying? You can spend weeks designing your beams, columns, braces, gusset plates, but when it gets right down to it, if during a seismic event the base plate fails, it's pretty much game over. That's it. It doesn't matter how good a job you do with all the rest of it. When your base plate fails, it's done. So it is one of the most important elements. AISC goes on further to say, the designer should use caution and good judgment in designing and detailing to ensure that you achieve the desired strength, stiffness, and ductility of this very important connection. First time I read that, I had to pause. I went back and read it again. Caution and good judgment? What were they talking about? I went back a third time. This time I underlined it. What do they know that I don't know? I've always been used to the idea that you just use P over N. The applied load divided by the number of anchor rods, size your anchor rods, and you move on. What do they know? Well, they know that it has been observed in numerous cases that there is significant and substantial damage in base plates after an earthquake. It's been seen throughout the world. That's nothing new. We do have a problem there. We also know that the seismic and wind force resisting design procedures for base plates and anchor bol bolts or anchor rods hasn't been all that well developed. Now don't misunderstand me. There's information out there. There's a lot of good information 
but it hasn't been well developed and compared to things like the dog bone connection, the link beam, or the yield line method for concentrically braced frames. And the last thing is that they know that the relative strength and stiffness of your base plates has a big impact on the stress distribution and failure modes in your structure and in the base plates. Think of it. If you model your base plate as pin connected, but it really behaves more fixed, or if you model it as fixed, but it behaves more as a pin connection, that has a huge impact on the distribution of stresses and forces in the whole frame. It also affects, the stiffness of your base plate also affects the distribution of stresses in the anchor rods and the base plate. Look at the facts. 426 buildings were investigated after major earthquakes. Of those, 26% of the moment frame buildings had substantial damage at the base plates. 29%, almost a third of our base plates for brace frames had substantial, significant damage. That's almost a full third. That says we have a problem. What did the researchers see? Well, they saw that there was unexpected early anchor rod failures. They saw excessive anchor rod elongation, large plastification of the base plates that led to brittle fracture. And by the way, the base plate is a prime breeding ground for brittle fracture. It's something that needs to be carefully considered. They also saw crushing of the concrete and grout. And then they saw weld failures, a lot of weld failures, specifically between the gusset plate and the base plate. The big question is, why? In general, we have an oversimplification in our design and analysis procedures. We've been using P over N, applied load divided by the number of anchor rods, but that gave us a third of our base plates failing. It's an oversimplification. We also know that there's some inaccuracies in our design assumptions. There's some errors in the things that we ignore. We often tend to ignore prying action. You'll see many articles, I've seen a number of them, where they say you can ignore the effects of prying action. It doesn't need to be considered. You're going to learn otherwise today. Ignoring the elastic, elastic properties of the steel. And then, in general, the overall stiffness of the whole assembly. The base plates, the columns, the gusset plates. But the reality is, and this is the hard one, and just so we can all remain friends in here, I want you to know that the dirty little secret doesn't apply to anybody here. It's all those other engineers out there, but it's nobody in here. The dirty little secret is simply this. We don't spend a lot of time working on our base plates. We don't spend a lot of effort in modeling them and trying to figure out how they really behave. The dirty little secret is unfortunate because it led to so many failures. The problem is we don't know what to do. We don't know what procedures to use. Well, the information we have is very limited. And so today's presentation, we're going to talk a little bit about some things that you need to know. This is very preliminary. It only takes us about 20 minutes to go through these. We're going to discuss how to model your concrete and grout. Sounds pretty basic. You'll be surprised at how many people get it wrong. We're going to talk about, do I need to model the anchor rods? Most of us don't, but I'll give you two really good reasons why. Should I be concerned about prying action? Absolutely. And I'll show you how to take it into account. Does the anchor rod position really matter? Sure, it has a big impact on the prying force. And then there's, the, of course, the catch-all. Won't a thick base plate solve all my problems? Now, if you believe that, I'm going to ask you, how thick is thick enough? You'll be surprised at what that answer comes up being. What about the rules of thumb? We've got a bunch of them. Most of them don't work. And then the big one. Can I use the uniform force method? We use it all the time to connect a gusset plate to a beam and a column, but is it applicable when you're connecting to a base plate? Let's start at the beginning. How do you model your concrete and grout? By the way, when we're done with these preliminaries, 
just so you don't think we're leaving off at that point, we're going to go in and talk about seven models that have been created that show you what slight variations in those variables do to the performance of the base plate. Before we get there, we've got to cover some preliminaries just so we're all starting out in the same place. The first question was, how do you model your concrete or grout? Well, the answer is, and the only answer is, as a compression-only spring. That imitates the effect of concrete. But then the problem is, is what is that value of K? What is the spring constant you put in your program? Now, if I asked 100 engineers, and I have, I'm going to get 100 different answers, but they tend to all cluster around the idea that this K value should be about the strength of the concrete. If you have 3,000 PSI concrete, use 3,000 PSI for your spring constant. And that's not very accurate. It's not even close. If you take and look at the 3,000 PSI concrete, imagine with me, if you'll just have a cube of concrete, 3,000 PSI, you push on it with a 3,000 pound load, ACI tells us that we should be getting about 0 0.003 inches of displacement. So a real spring constant is a million pound inches. A million, not 3,000, not 10,000, not 15,000. I'll be honest, for years I've been guessing myself, what is the right spring constant? It comes out to being about a million. And it depends on the quality of concrete you're using, the grade of concrete. Let me show you how that affects the model. As your spring constant goes up, your base plate stress has actually come down considerably. The reason is, is when you look at this model, if you're pulling up, vision that as being a base plate, when you're pulling up on it, if your spring constant's too low, your base plate's just gonna bend. It's pushing into something about the consistency of jello when it's 3,000, and the spring constant's 3,000. The stiffer your spring constant, the more the base plate is forced to yield in a method like this. And that imitates more what we see in real life. Spring constant's too low, you get unusually high stresses. It also affects the forces in your anchor rod. As the spring constant goes up, and this is one you have to think about, the force in your anchor rod also goes up. And it's because in this condition, the base plate is prying. It's pulling up, adding some extra force into the tune of about 16, 18%. When you use a very low spring constant, you don't see these extra effects. The value you get from your model is exactly equal to the applied load. If you use a spring constant in there of about a million, you get a much higher force. So the spring constant has a big impact on your base plate stresses, your displacements and rotations, anchor rod forces, and of course, welds. And we'll talk more about those in a minute. The next question was, modeling your anchor rods. Do you need to? Almost always, and for years, I've modeled them as pinned, pinned. Most of us would moderate pin pin or pin roller, and that's, that's okay. I don't do that anymore because I model my anchor rod as being fixed at the base plate, although that's overly conservative. It's not really accurate, but it, it's somewhat fixed. I've got a leveling nut on the bottom and a nut on top. It's tight in there pretty good. It's not fixed, but it's close. And I model it as pinned, and this length varies depending on the embedment length, the grout depth, and the diameter of my anchor rod. Very good reason why I do this. It does have an impact on the results you get. If you're using pin, pin, pin roller, you get forces that are a little higher in your anchor rods than this. I'm using this value over here, fixed pinned in my base plate. Now the reason I use that is because there's a lot of secondary forces that become present in your anchor bolt. As the base plate is bending and shifting, as things are moving, you're getting secondary shears and secondary moments, and I want to know what those are because they have an impact on the size of the anchor rod that I choose. This value of one right here represents the applied load, so you can see that in all cases I'm getting some effect from prying action, but it's not, you know, it does have an impact. But the real reason that I model my anchor rods is because of this guy. This is the mystery guy on my job sites, the grouter guy. He's like the tooth fairy to me. He just shows up disappears. I never really see him. He just kind of comes in the middle of the night, does his job, and leaves. When I saw him on my job site, I was thrilled. I followed him around for hours. He was like cordial at first and got real irritated later on. I was asking him questions like, hey, you know, I've got 
I've got six anchor rods in there. How are you making sure that grout's getting packed in there real tight around them? After a while, he took that stick and shook it at me and said, I'm not making any effort to make sure that grout's packed in there. He says, all I do is I drop a blob of grout, shove it in with the stick. When it comes out the other side, I taper it off and I shove in another blob of grout. Ow! You know, that wasn't the answer I was hoping for. But the real revelation came about an hour later. He was half done with my job. He ran out of grout. I went up and said, hey, you ran out of grout, huh? He took that same, same stick, shook it at me again, said, I wouldn't have if you weren't here. <laughs> what was he telling me? I would have had those beautiful little truncated cones underneath my base plate, followed by 50% void in the center somewhere. This is one reason why I now require my grout installation to be special inspected, continuously inspected. I want somebody looking at that and making sure it's installed. And if it isn't installed, I want to know what's happening to my anchor rod. That's why I model it. And let's be honest, when it comes to these kind of things, we're not the greatest at thinking about the fillings of the grouter guy. We give him conditions like this to work on. There's concrete on both sides. You got this rebar in the way, it's a dirty condition. It's going to be tough to get that clean as you think you would want it to be. So think about that guy and trying to get that grout installed around your ankle bolts. It's important in the performance of your base plate. The next one, and this is a biggie, the prying action. I don't know if you're offices like many that I've been in, but as you thumb through the AISC code, don't you see all the pages are dirty? I mean, they, they got marks on them and outline, you know, information. They're well used. When it comes to the section on prying action, that thing's as clean as the day the book was new. And the problem is the equation we have is so limited in its usefulness. It applies to this condition and it works beautifully. But if you get a really complex situation, it doesn't work so well. The things that affect the prying action, the force, is the strength of the material, obviously. The thickness and the length of the leg. The gauge on the anchor rods. And of course the magnitude of the applied load. Prying action isn't a phenomenon to be ignored. It's a phenomenon that we need to take account of somehow. And it's just as applicable in this condition. If you take that T-beam, turn it upside down, put some anchor rods on it and some grout, you find out that we've got a base plate and a gusset plate. It's been documented. Prying action is just as applicable in this condition as it is in a steel-to-steel -steel connection. It needs to be considered. In addition, something that really affects the magnitude of the force here is that spring constant. That's why that spring constant becomes so very important when you're modeling your base plate. Prying action matters. And yes, it really, really, really matters. Here's the base plate stresses at four inch gauge. And this is a very simple T-beam because all I did was vary the distance between my anchor rods. At four inches, my base plate stress is equal to my allowable bending stress. If I go up to eight inches, so we're going from four inches to eight inches. That's not very much. Four inches to eight inches. 8 inches were 80% higher stresses in the base plate. Does the position of those anchor rods matter? I see a lot of base plates with the anchor rods stuck way out here, 12 inches apart. Are they designing for 80% higher stresses in their base plate? Probably not. It also affects the forces in your anchor rod. Again, we start at 4 inches and we see that the results from my finite element model are only about 4% higher than the applied load. Not a big increase. But it doesn't take much. You go over here to 8 inches and all of a sudden we're at 30% higher forces. And who's designing their anchor bolts for 30% higher forces just randomly? Or 80% higher base plate stresses? We're just not doing that. But it's something we need to consider very carefully. Now, I realize that a lot of yielding is happening right in here, so these numbers are more academic than realistic. But the fact is, it shows a trend in what's happening. We can't just be arbitrary in the positioning of our base plate or our anchor rods. The next one, what about that thick base plate option? Don't we all love that? 
somebody come wandering in and say, well, you know, I didn't want to check that prying action nonsense. I don't want to have to deal with all that stuff. So I just thickened my base plate. Yeah, yeah. Well, how thick did you make it? Well, I only needed three quarters, but yeah, bumped it up to seven eighths. Yeah, that doesn't work. In our very simple T-beam model, a three-quarter inch thick base plate gives us about that 20% higher force in our anchor rods. In order to completely negate the effect of prying action on your anchor rods, you got to be over two inches thick. Well, an inch and three-quarter to two inches thick. I'll be honest, I'm not seeing a lot of two-inch thick base plates around. So prying action, this thickened base plate. And this is a very simple model. This isn't the answer. Two inches isn't the answer, I'll promise you, because it varies depending on unique circumstances. But in our very simple model, it's got to be two inches thick. Now's a good time to stop and talk about those rules of thumb. We've got a lot of rules of thumb out there. Well, they were a, a lifesaver when I first started out. After all that work designing my column, somebody said, oh yeah, just size your anchor rod, diameter your anchor rod, that's the size of your base plate, thickness of your base plate. That's where we went. But those rules of thumb only apply really for a gravity load carrying column. They don't apply, we don't have rules of thumb for lateral force resisting columns because we have too much variation. There's a lot of variables that are involved here. Well. I'll just encourage you, if you have a rule of thumb you'd like me to check out for you, send it to me. Email address is right here at the bottom. But I haven't found one that works yet. Now the big one. Uniform force method. We all use it all the time. I'd be surprised if there was anybody here that isn't very, very familiar with it. It's a wonderful procedure for taking the forces in a gusset plate. And you balance these loads. You balance it so that you have a net moment of zero about the work point. It's a great tool. Simplifies the connection greatly. But it makes a few assumptions and they are that this element is rigid and these elements that you're connecting to are also rigid. Very rigid. For example, when you're connecting a beam and a column, gusset plate in there, you have some capacity here. That gusset plate, when, that, when the force is coming through the brace and it's pushing on the gusset plate, gusset plate's pushing on the column, the column has lots of capacity to push back. It's not going to buckle, it's not going to yield, it's not going to bend. That works very well in this case. The column, or the beam also has plenty of capacity. It can push back. It resembles this. So it works. But the question is, does it work at a base plate? You have capacity here in this column. This is a small column. Ignore that fact. But I have capacity. This column can push it back against this column. And when the column or the gusset plate's being pulled, it can pull back. I have plenty of shear capacity here. But what about the base plate? Now I have plenty of shear capacity for the welds here. But what if it's flexible? And it, flexible can mean a lot of things. Flexible, maybe your anchor rods are way out here. So your base plate can bend a lot. That's flexible. Or maybe your anchor rods are only four inches apart, but it's very thin, so it's flexible. What happens? The two horizontal lines represent the forces you get, what you would be designing for using the uniform force method. The red line represents the forces you get from your model. You can see that we're almost 90% higher forces, tension forces over here. This area is an area where we're unconservative. And also notice that we've got a compression area. So at the column face, when the base plate is flexible and can move, we get this kind of a distribution in forces. But this is what the uniform force method would be predicting. It's an area where we need to consider a little more carefully. The shearing forces aren't quite as bad. We're only about 25% high. But it's over a substantial length of the column. The base plate stiffness is only one element. What about the column stiffness? Just for the record, for those of you that are doing seismic design, AISC strongly recommends you not use these type of connections in seismic design. The problem is I see this creeping in a lot. I see it regularly, even in seismic region. So the base plate, let's pretend like it's now very, very flexible. The column face, or excuse me, the base plate is very rigid, but the column face is more flexible. What happens? 
Again, the horizontal force is representing what you would see from the uniform force method. And remember, the uniform force method is going to say that it's all in tension or all in compression. And yet we see that we've got areas in tension and we've got some areas in compression. I've got to apologize. This slide looks just like the one I showed you two previous slides here. And the reason is is because of the model I created. It happens to be 24 by 24 coming off the angles uh, for the force applied load is 40 degrees, something like that. The answers would be very different if your gusset plate was 24 by 16 or 18 by 30 or all the other huge variations of forces and angles that you would use. In this case, I took the easy way out. My plate, my model here is symmetrical. But it gives you an indication. We have the same issue. And we have the same problem with the shearing forces again. We're about 30% higher shearing forces than you get from the uniform force method. So, can you use the uniform force method? I would say it depends. The answer isn't definitely no, but you have to consider the stiffness of all these connected elements very, very carefully. Now that concludes the, the preliminaries. That's just the groundwork. So we'll all come to an understanding of, of this next section, which deals with the alpha. You know, in engineering, we like to use a lot of acronyms, so I made this one up just for this session. The alpha is the average lateral force resisting base plate system. Now, it's so important that you understand what average means. If I was to take the last 100 jobs that we've all done, this would be the average column size, average gusset plate size, average base plate size, average anchor rod position. Everybody in here has seen this. We probably have something like this on our desk right now. It's the average. It's not some little itty bitty column and small force. It's not some great big thing either. It's the thing you and I work on every day. It's very simple to model. It's one inch plate elements. Uh, the forces are all coming in right here on the base plate. Let's look at, I've got seven of these put together. I'm gonna look at the first three together. They're not identical, but they need to be considered as a group because they are very similar in that everything about them is the same other than on this one, model A, the gusset plate comes all the way to the end of the base plate. Over here, we stop just on the left-hand side of the column. Over here, we stop at the right-hand side of the column. Small change, does it matter? This is the force in the weld between the gusset plate and the base plate. The horizontal lines represent the uniform force method the green line represents the instantaneous center of rotation method, and the blue line represents the forces from our model. And you notice we get bump up here, a peak of 35 kips. Over here we're about 20 kips, which is about in this area. All of this area is where we're unconservative. We would be designing down in this area when we should be designing up here for that stress. Also of interest is this compression block down here. Remember, the uniform force method would say, I have a gusset plate that's being pulled up in tension. I have a base plate that's being pulled up. These forces should all be lifting up on the base plate, and yet I have this compression block. Let's look at B. B, we find similar results. Again, but here's a big difference. Just by cutting back that base of the gusset plate four inches, four inches I took off the gusset plate, saving a little bit of steel. Look what happened to the peak. It jumped up from 20 all the way up to 30 kips per inch in this area. It's a big increase. And it has to do with the stiffness of all these interconnected elements. It's not just looking at one element. It's the stiffness of all of these elements. Again, we have this compression block. Notice now we're down to about 25 kips per inch way out here on the end. A substantial increase. See, we stopped the gusset plate at the face of the column. Interesting that this didn't increase anymore. By shortening my gusset plate even longer, or making it even shorter, I still end up about 30 kips per inch. I still end up with this big compression block. And on all these areas, I'm still under design compared to the uniform force method. Let's look at the anchor rods all together. This is why I found it gets really interesting. These are the forces in all three models, the anchor rods for each condition. This is the applied load or what you would get from P over N. Look at what happens. The blue column, that's these anchor rods on grid line A. The red, 
is over here on grid line B. But notice how they change. Just by shortening the gusset plate four inches, the force on this anchor rod came down and the force over here went up. Almost 50% higher forces in your anchor rods. And you notice as you cut the uh, gusset plate back further, this difference separated. So the forces in these, you can see them, they kind of traded places. The one that had the highest amount of tension before is now something less. Small changes have a big impact. It needs to be considered. Now, in these models, the centroid of this group of anchor rods is about right here. So there's some eccentricity from the centroid of the column to the center of the anchor rod group. What happens if we do this? Now this is a typical corner column. Yeah, maybe it's not really typical, but as far as the positioning of the anchor rods, it's fairly common. So we have a big eccentricity. How does that affect the design? Now these two I can plot together because they behave very similar. Even though one has two more anchor rods, they behave very similar. The only place where there's a difference is way out here on the end, but you notice this peak. Do you remember it was at 30 kips per inch? By moving all my anchor rods to one side of the column now, that stress in my weld is up to 60 kips per inch. That's a big increase again. And the force down here, this compression block, is now substantially more. It's up to about 50 kips per inch. So obviously, moving the anchor rods to all on one side of the column wasn't such a great idea. So let's look at the forces in the anchor rods. Here we find out that the anchor rods closest to the column, well, they're about 100% overstressed. They have 100% more load in them than you would anticipate using the instantaneous center method. 100% higher forces. Do you think about that when you're laying out your anchor rods? Most of us don't. Let's take the same group of anchor rods and let's center them more around the column. So the centroid of the anchor rod group is in line with the column. We can look at those all together. And it gets really interesting is that we still have these areas where we're unconservative, but at least we're getting closer. We're back down to 20 kips per inch. We have that compression block, but now it's only at five kips per inch. You're almost non-existent in the case where all the anchor rods are symmetrical around the column. There's a difference and it has a big impact on, on the forces. How you, how you model your anchor rods, where you place them, the length of your gusset plate, it all comes into, it, it has an important role in deciding what your real force levels are and your stress distributions. If we look at the forces in the anchor rods, we find out we're about 40% high. It's not 200% or 100% high, but we're still 40% high compared to what you would get from the instantaneous center method. It gets real fun now. We looked at all seven of those models individually. When we look at them all on the same page, we find something very interesting. Now, this is important to understand that the model in general was all the same. The column was the same size. The base plate was all the same size. The gauge on my anchor rods was all the same size. The gusset plate in general was the same size, although you know, and I showed you where we cut it back and added some length to it. But look at the wild variations that we have. And it has to do with the stiffness of the system. Not the stiffness of the gusset plate, but it's the stiffness of the whole system. The column, the base plate, anchor rods, everything combined. You notice that we have these peaks here. And again, I can't emphasize enough. The applied load was all the same. And yet look at the distribution and stresses. The applied load was all the same. The compression block, it exists. It's there, pretty obvious, and all the, all the models. The forces in the anchor rods. Now when you get in here and compare the forces in the anchor rods, you see very quickly, and this is each one of the models laid out in one graph. Here's the applied load, so everything above it is where we're unconservative. But you see very quickly that when you have your anchor rods a little more concentric, you get a little better performance. Yeah, I know we're overstressed, but at least it isn't like this. Or varying like that. It is, it does vary, no doubt about it. But it gives you a feeling for what's, what's really happening. And remember, again, 
the applied load was all the same. Now this is a great time for us to pause and think for just a second. There's, there's two important concepts I don't want you to miss out on here. One of them is pretty obvious. I'm sure you've all got it. The other one may have slipped by. The obvious one is, again, the applied load was all the same. I just made very small adjustments in the location of the anchor rods. I shifted them this way and that. Changed the length of the gas. How many times do you go into your office on a Monday morning and say to yourself, by golly, you know, it's Monday, I'm going to be the engineer of the world, and my gusset plates are going all the way to the end of the base plate. And then by Friday, you're doing something else. You've shortened up the gusset plate, changed what you're doing to your anchor rods. See, if you're using the P over N approach, the applied load divided by the number of anchor rods, none of this is coming out of your equation. None of this is being taken into account. The important fact here is small adjustments, whether it's moving the anchor rods or cutting back the uh, gusset plate, small adjustments have a huge impact that need to be very carefully considered in your calculations. Small adjustments. These are the kind of things that we've been looking over, looking past, looking through, ignoring for a long time. So small adjustments have a big impact. The other thing is, do you remember what those 426 researchers found when they were looking at the base plates? Do you remember what they found? They found unexpected early anchor rod failures. Really? They saw excessive anchor rod elongation. Okay, I could see that. They saw large plastification of the base plate, which led to brittle fracture. They saw crushing of the grout in concrete. Well, that's for sure. I can see where that's coming from. And then they saw failure of the welds. A lot of failures in the welds between the gusset plate and the base plate. Now, I'm not so naive nor arrogant enough to suggest that this is the answer. It just isn't. There's other variables in here that need to be considered that I haven't taken into account. But doesn't this give you a feel for where we maybe need to be headed when we're looking at our base plates and anchor rods? I, I don't know. I, I get the feeling like maybe 60, 70, 80, maybe even 90%. I can see now why we had 30% of our base plates filling. I'm not saying that's the only reason, but I think we're headed in the right direction. We have a procedure here you can use, you can implement immediately in order to design these base plates and have them per perform in a more predictable manner. Better design is going to mean less failures. Now we've talked so much about the base plate itself, but that's only one component of a successful design. The other one is the anchor rod. Isn't it great now that AISC and ACI finally, finally come together with one equation that gives us the capacity for an anchor rod in tension? But ACI went one step further. They gave us the extra limit state to check, and that was the bearing area on the head of the bolt or the nut. This is a significant number, and it's a, it's a number you need to pay very close attention to. I'm, they tell you, ACI tells you, you can use the full bearing area. I use just this radius, concentric circle. Two reasons. First of all, I can get the width of that nut right out of the steel manual. I can calculate the radius, and therefore the area. The other is, I don't know what their nut on their anchor rod looked like. I don't know what the head of their bolt looked like. Or the, ends perfectly parallel or did they have these chamfers or this bump up now you see that all the time in our bolts and I'm okay with that but I'm not sure how those little anomalies affect the performance of that bearing so I use this area and I'm going to qualify that because I use the partial bearing area AC, AISC has a design guide that has a table very similar to this and it's based on the full head of the nut mine's on the partial mine's a little bit less Okay, so now we have a procedure. We can design our base plates. We know what we need to do to make it stiff enough. We come into a table like this 
Because that, well, now that we've got the base plate design, we can design the anchor rods. We can jump into the table like this and say, let's just pretend we have 40 kips. 40 kips is the answer. We need to use a 7 8 inch diameter anchor rod. We can come over here and use a grade 105 anchor rod. We needed 40 kips, we've got 43. Life is good, right? We move on to the next set of anchor rods. No. This is where we stop and go back and check the bearing on the head of the nut. It's only good for 18 kips. I went in with 40. I got 43 out of the bolt. The head is only good for 18. I got a problem. Three options. One of them is to use a washer, and I know ACI complains about this incessantly. They were always whining about it. The concrete guy is always boo-hooing about it. These washers just get in the way. They're hard to install. Does it really matter? I need to get 40 kips. I've only got 18. The other option is you can increase the strength of your concrete. In this case, go from 3,000 PSI up to 7,000 PSI concrete. Or option three would be go to an inch and three-eighths diameter anchor rod, which would get you 40 kips. But checking on that bearing area is so important. A couple years ago, I was doing a plan review. I've noticed that the engineer hadn't taken this into account, the bearing area on his nut. So I wrote it up, and I said, you need to check this. He wrote back to me and said, I don't need to check it because I lengthened my anchor rods eight inches. You can lengthen them eight feet. It doesn't change the fact that the bearing area is the bearing area. This is one of the most overlooked checks, I think, in our designs today. It needs to be very carefully considered. It is the limiting factor. It's not the str and if you notice, even at grade 36, all of these are governed or controlled by the, uh, the bearing area. Even on your lightly grade 36 anchor rods, the bearing area on the head of that nut, or the, the, the head of the bolt of the nut, controls the force, the capacity. Well, we're going to look at one more application. I'm not going to take credit for this because I stole it. AISC a few years ago had a wonderful uh, presentation that they brought out. It was the lateral design of lateral force resisting systems, steel structures. It was a fantastic program. It was an all day seminar. Had everything you could ever imagine in it. Hundreds of slides. It was beams and columns, braces, gusset plates. More information you could ever imagine. And when it got to the base plate design, there was two slides. So I decided to take the information they had. I used their column size, their base plate thickness, their layout for the anchor rods. All of this is theirs. And I applied to all of the information that we've just learned to it. I put in the, the correct spring constants, modeled the whole assembly, not as a, a stiff element, you know, making the assumption that everything was stiff and rigid, but modeled it so that the flexibility of all these materials could come into play. And I was really surprised at the results. The blue bars here represents the normal, or the peel over in approach. The red bars represent the instantaneous center of rotation. The gold bars represent the results I got from my model. I couldn't have been more flabbergasted. I was surprised. First of all, these bolts out here in the corner, they're not doing nearly as much work as I would have thought they would have. Even worse, the, the banker rod over here that's in line with this web, a stiff element, okay, it's doing almost 100 kips more work than the two next to it. I was also surprised to find out the anchor rods that are really doing the work are these two. That didn't come out intuitive to me. I would have thought it would be these three doing, having the higher force. But it's these two. The, the anchor rods closest to the neutral axis, well, they're doing about par for the course. Nothing too special there. The anchor rods at the compression area, well, they're not doing much work at all. But let's look at this by the numbers. If you use the P over N approach, you're designing for 133 kips. Two inch diameter, grade 55 anchor rods, they'll do the trick. On you go. And that's using P over N, the applied load divided by the number of anchor rods. That's a solution. If you look at the results that take into account the stiffness of your system, you should be designing for 218 kips. A 63% increase. That's a big increase. 
You can still use two inch diameter anchor rods, but they need to be grade 105. So now we're done, right? Now we can move on to the next set of anchor rods. No. We still have to go back and check that bearing. It's only good for 81 kips. 81, I need 218. I got a problem there. It's called a plate washer. It goes a long way here. So make sure and check. Make that part of the, the check that you do in your design. Check your anchor rods. Of course, that comes obvious. We all do that. But check that bearing area because this is critical for getting a good design. I don't know if you guys are like me, but I think most engineers are a little bit of control freaks. No offense, please, but we are. We, we, don't we all love to write seismic controls, wind controls, this controls, that controls? Something's always got a control, doesn't it? It's our way of taking this huge amount of data, running it through a, a filter, then putting it into a funnel, and out the bottom comes this bare minimum of things that are individual that we need to check. And it works for 90% of your steel structure. It's great. Use it all the time. But the one place that it doesn't work is in your base plates. There's too much variation in what's going on there. Column type, column sizes, column orientation, anchor rod locations, thickness of base plate. See, it's not one of the common misconceptions I see is people will take the maximum force that's being delivered to their base plate and say, this is my design, I'm going to use it. It doesn't work that way. This may have the biggest force, but remember, or this one might have the biggest force. Remember, this spike here was only at 30 kips per inch, or 20 kips per inch. Over here was at 60 kips per inch. This may be lighter loaded, but it's the controlling factor. You can't get that unless you consider each base plate individually as unique entities. So if people say, which controls? I don't know. I've got to model it and analyze it to figure it out. As we wrap up here, there's two questions that everybody has. Two big questions, and absolutely nobody wants to ask them. And so I'm just going to answer them for you. I'll make it easy on all of us. The first one is, what do we do now? Does the information I've just presented to you in some way supersede any or all of what you know about base plates? The answer is absolutely not. It, it just doesn't. There's a, AISC has two great design guides, Design Guide 1 and 7. They both deal a lot with base plates and anchor rods. If you don't have them, you've got to get them. They're important to have in your library. Great resource material. The University of Minnesota has a wonderful synthesis that they've got. It's free on the internet. Download it, it's big, and it's worth reading every single page of it. A lot of good information. But what we have is a, a lot of breadth of information. We've got a whole lot of information, a lot of breadth. What I've tried to do here is provide you with a little more depth, a little more appreciation of what you can do until we get you know, better formalized procedures, how you can model your base plates. I've tried to follow in the st with the recommendation of Richard Fenman. He's a Nobel Prize winner scientist, a man I greatly admire. He's got a lot of books out there. He's an impressive individual. And he sums it up by saying, people don't want so many equations. What they want is to understand the ideas better. Now, if you notice, throughout this whole presentation, I've only given you one equation. By the time this conference is over, you will thank me for that. <laughs> one equation. But I hope I've planted some seeds. There's a lot of ideas here. I haven't given you all the answer, but I've given you a way that you can take back and think about and consider some of these ideas. How can you implement them in your office? What can you do? How can you incorporate it to make your base plates perform in a reliable and predictable manner? The other important question is, isn't this just a little i got to put the right voice on for this. Isn't this just a little too much for a base plate? That's a common question. I hear that all the time. And my answer is no. Because I keep seeing with surprising 
frequency these kind of connections. Now this I blame on the engineer entirely. It's built exactly the way it was designed. This is the way it showed it in the drawings. Uh, look at the gusset plate here. Uh, to make matters worse, I got another brace coming in from this side. Same kind of gusset plate. Notice there's no stiffener over on this end. It's interesting. This is a multi-story building. It's, to, it's within a mile of a major fault. It's got plenty of issues with it. But the biggest issue it has is these anchor rods, base plates. It turns out when you do the analysis of this base plate, by the way, the columns and braces, everything were just what they needed to be. They were right. When you did the analysis of the base plate, you find out that for gravity load pushing down plus the seismic overturning force pushing down, that base plate is exactly what it needs to be for the gravity downward loads. For the seismic overturning gravity loads, it's exactly what it needs to be. Now that's assuming these guys' plates are going to perform in any way or whatsoever in a reliable manner, which isn't going to happen anyway. But let's assume that these are good gusset plates, the forces are applied, this base plate works 100%. And when you look at this base plate, for uplift forces, the same overturning forces pulling up on the base plate, the footing is in there pulling down on it, it's exactly 20% of what it needs to be. 80% overstressed. So when people ask me, isn't this a little too much for a base plate? The answer is no. Because we keep seeing things like this. Remember that compression block? What happens if I've got nothing to push against? How does that affect the performance of the stresses and the anchor rods? And this one, this one is the fabricator's fault. I know that because this is my building. I'm from the West Coast. We design our connections. I designed up some nice base plates and gusset plates. I had the whole thing taken care of. Send it back east to be built. Fabricator called up one and bam, these are terrible. This is gonna, you're going to bankrupt us. We don't do things like that out here. He says, why don't you just send me the forces? I'll design it for you. I said, well, okay. I heard you guys back east did things that way. So I sent him my forces. He sent me the shop drawings. They looked just like this. I rejected them. I said, where's your calculations? I was amazed. Nah, I was appalled. When I got out to the job site, the contractor put pressure on the fabricator. Fabricator fabricated without approved shop drawings. I get out to the job site, and they're erecting still. This is what it looked like. I called the fabricator and said, hey, where's the calculations? They said, no, Barry, you don't understand. You don't have to worry about that. We sent you stamped shop drawings. I said, no, where's the calculations? They said, no, you don't understand. We took responsibility for it. I said, give me the calculations. No, you don't understand. That's not how we do it out here. His calculations were dated 1964 little bit dated. Yeah, they weren't happy, but we went through and cut all this stuff out right in place. Went in very slick and put in some nice gusset plates and a real base plate. Made you feel like a man. <laughs> so when they asked me, isn't this a little too much for a base plate? I say absolutely not. It's not too much for this very critical an important class of connection that requires the designer, that's you and I, the designers, to use caution and good judgment. I hope you'll take some of these tidbits of information, these new insights back to your office, ponder them. It takes a little bit of getting used to. This is a new effort. It opens up a whole new arena of things we have to be concerned about. And I hope that you'll take it seriously and get involved in trying to understand and model your base plates and see how they really perform. And with that, I'll turn the time back over to Carol. Or if anybody has any questions, are we over time? I didn't see you waving your hands, so.
You're very welcome. Thank you.